Welcome to Glad One Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hordup with Release His Kingdom. Uh, today, Lord, as we will look into your word in a moment, I pray that we would be mindful that you go before us. And when you move before us and you lead us and your people are obedient, incredible, miraculous things happen. So, Father, today I pray as I look into the Word, as I share your Word, I pray that you would help me to share and to, and to teach your Word in a correct manner. I pray that you would help us all to have our hearts and our minds open to what you have for us. And that we would embrace in obedience um, following you and listening to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn uh, to, the, to the Old Testament, to the book of Numbers, to chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, I'm going to read a few verses there. We're going to begin with verse 26. Numbers 13, beginning verse 26, it says this, Then they came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. But then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take the land, or we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, which means they were really tall and really big. They came from the Nephilim. We, stopped. we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. I want you to take a few moments right now, and I want you to consider this question. I want you to consider what is the one thing in your life right now that is causing you the greatest concern? What is it right now that comes to your mind that you know is of great concern for you? That thing that you know will require some action on your part. Maybe something has come to your mind that you know requires a course correction, and you know it will, it will be a course correction, but maybe something you haven't had to do before. Maybe you're not sure how to go about it. Maybe, maybe it's something you're already in the process of working through, and it still seems daunting. But what is it that comes to your mind that is of great concern. <clears throat> Maybe it's something that comes to your mind and it seems too big, you simply haven't even begun to address it yet. Because you've already determined this is too big for me to do anything about it. Obstacles are common in life. I think about Seth Van Tiflin. He's a normal guy from Bad Axe, Michigan. When you meet him, he just he seems like a normal guy. Many of you have met him. He seems normal, right? But he learns about the issues in, in Asia and he learns about what's happening there. He he learns more about human trafficking. He hears what's happening to these children, and now he is he is an important piece in launching safe houses and rescuing hundreds of children. Many people had seen that problem, had seen that situation and said, this is too big. It's too great. He saw the situation. He saw the obstacle. Then he listened to God's leading. He 
and God is making a difference using him and those who serve the ministry with him to do that. Obstacles are common in life. An obstacle is a thing that blocks one's way or prevents or hinders one's progress. They are not uncommon. They are part of life. Sometimes we may not recognize an obstacle until it has taken us so far off course that we wonder how to get back. Sometimes we see an obstacle in front of us and it's, and it's so big we lose the ability to see beyond it so we, we never address it. But there are those times when we trust God and when we allow Him to do the work in us and we move around or over that obstacle. Today we've, uh, we've, we're honoring our vets and those who serve. Every, every person who trains in the military goes through basic training and goes through obstacle courses. I've seen films and pictures of it. And when I see those, I think, I know I can't do that. Or there's those races right now that are popular, the, the, all the different ones that they, they had the, com the competitors go through mud and under bob wire and over walls and up ropes and around these things. I can't do that. But there are those who see that and they see that as a di in a different way than I see that. And they see those, those obstacles and those athletes who, who will say, I can train and I can prepare for that. So they train and they train uh, physically to build up the stamina they need and, and the, the muscle memory they need. And they also train mentally to prepare for each obstacle as it changes and is presented so they can be ready to overcome it. This is what I know, every one of us, whether we're brand new and following Christ or we've been following Christ for a long time, we're going to face obstacles the entire time we live on planet Earth. We will face challenges. We will face things that we cannot ignore. And it's important that we learn to identify what's in front of us so we can, so we can pre, be prayed up and prepared to move through and over that obstacle following God's lead. God will make himself known, and we will see him work. In fact, we see God's hand at work when we are in the most difficult times in our life. But I also know this. If you are not in the habit of being in the word of God, if you are not in the habit of leaning in and listening to what God has for you, when you face obstacles, you will find that you are not prepared and are not able of overcoming that obstacle. We need to be able to listen and hear the voice of God. Moses and the children of Israel come up to the promised land that God had promised to give to them. If you turn back to the book of Exodus, chapter 23, it says, the Lord says to Moses and has Moses take this message to the people uh, telling them that this land is theirs. Chapter 23, verse 27 of Exodus, it says this, I will send my, my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. God had promised them, when you get to the land, it's yours. You're to begin to take the land. I'll go ahead of you. The decision was made. He told them the obstacles are going to be there. In this passage, it says there's going to be people there that don't want to leave. And here's who they are. The Lord had promised it to the children of Israel. And he promised to be with them. This is what I want to remind you of. Several weeks ago, I talked about this truth. God loves you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He loves you with everything. God loves you so much, he became like us. King of the earth that he created became 
flesh, lived with us, walked with us, came to serve them all, died on the cross for us, rose again. God loves you with everything. It is God's intent. It is God's desire that you choose to accept his love, that you choose to walk in the same relationship with him. You were made for that kind of relationship. The Lord Jesus Christ longs to go before you. And when you know and you, you are surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're following his lead, he is with you. You belong to him. He will not leave you. And the word of God affirms for us over and over again this truth that we serve the living God who overcomes the evil one. And it isn't what we do, it's what God does as we follow him. The enemy who seeks to stop the word of God cannot be overcome by the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are part of his family. We are part of his kingdom. We're not in heaven yet, we know that. But we're part of his kingdom. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you know that you've been rescued by his love. If you are following him and you, you have accepted him with everything you have, you're part of his family and his kingdom. And he goes before you. The evil one has no, no say in your life. Don't believe the lies that he tells you. The children of Israel came to the promised land. The Lord said to Moses, send out some men to explore the land of Canaan. So he took, he took representatives from every, every, Israeli, every Israelite tribe and he sent them into the land. He said, explore it thoroughly. And if you read the preceding chapters, he said, go into the land, see what it's like, see what the soil's like, see what kind of, what kind of fruit it produces, see, see what it's like to live, find out everything you can about it. And they found all kinds of good things about it. They found that it produced, produced fruit so that was better than they could ever imagine. Found that it was a good place to live, spent 40 days spying out the land. They came back with a good report. They said, Moses, it's as the Lord said, it's, it's flowing with milk and honey and air, it's producing crops, fruit in abundance. has everything and more that is needed. But Moses, there's bad news. The people there are of great size. They know how to fight. And they determined that this was, this fact was too great, too difficult too big to overcome. We cannot take the land, Moses. But there was, there was someone there that said, we can take the land. Caleb, remember, the Lord promised us this land. And we must go in and take it. The Lord has given it to us. But the people were so overcome with fear of the other spies that they spread a bad report. They made the report even worse than what it was. They began to tell lies about the land and they stirred up amongst the people. This is not where we should go. The result was they wound up walking in circles for 40 more years before the Lord delivered the land to them. God has been showing me some things recently. And he's been teaching me some things within, within my own life and within my own heart. And he's been showing me things and saying to me, I want you to trust me more. I want you to be mindful that, that I am moving ahead of you with all that is needed to accomplish my work and my will. And the Lord's been reminding me that there are things that I see as obstacles that are too big. You ever look at life and look at where you are and think there's an obstacle that's too big? I do sometimes. And I'm, coming, I'm speaking today, I'm not coming from a place of discouragement. but the Lord is doing good things in my heart. Okay, but, I, but I want to be honest with you because 
For, for me, I've come through a rather difficult season of ministry. But not bad difficult. Difficult where God's teaching me things. If that makes sense to you. And God is showing me and he is reminding me that he is still over all things. In those moments where, where I become worried about something in the community, or worried about finances, or worried about how, how, how Lord, how are we going to do this next ministry? We don't have the people. We don't have this one. You know, if you ever have those days where you can make a list of everything that you don't have to do something? I have days like that. But God's showing me, he says, he says, would you follow me? The church follows me. And he reminds me that God will continue to move and to give us everything we need to accomplish his will. And God says, you know what? He says, he says to me, you know what? This is what he's been impressing on me. And, and, and it keeps coming to me again and again as I read the word of God, as I write in my journals. Um, I'm a little thick-headed, so it would be nice if he just sat down and said to me, Hey, Phil, here's what you need to know. <laughs> and after I get up from the floor, <laughs> but he's been very, very clear. He keeps, he keeps reminding me, he says, look, I have more and more things to accomplish in this community and beyond in this community, and I'm going to do it in ways in which you've never seen me do it before. He says, and I'm not hindered by what you see as limitations. I'm doing a new thing. So I'm excited. I don't come at you today with, with the spirit of discouragement. Oh, I'm coming to you. I'm sharing with you that God is doing some big things. And he wants you to be part of it. He wants me to be part of it. But he needs for us to say, oh, Lord, you promised that you will make your word known in this community, in this region, and in this world. And you will use us. He doesn't promise that it will be easy. He doesn't promise that, it won't, that we won't have some, some fears. He doesn't promise that we won't have some anxiety about it. But you know what? He is going to do it. And we will obey him and follow him. He will accomplish his work. If you have your Bibles, go to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and then... Luke in your New Testament, go to chapter 10. I go to this passage fairly often in my walk with the Lord, and I want to, I want to go to it now. This is a, a point in Jesus' ministry where, uh, where the Lord is appointing 72 followers of Christ. Men and women who are not like you and I. Men and women who simply were followers of Jesus, who were learning from him, who were listening to him, who had listened to his disciples. And Jesus called the 72 followers of Christ. And it says this in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 10, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. So Jesus said to these 72, he says, look, he says, I'm sending you out to go ahead of me, and I'm going to go every place where you're going, and I want you to go into these places. He says, it's the harvest field. Well, if it's harvest time, that means there are things that are ready to, ready to be harvested, right? <laughs> He says, I'm sending you into the harvest. There are those who are ready to hear the truth of who Jesus is and who are, who are longing to know of his love. That is true today. It's true in my family. I have family members who, who need to know that they are loved by God with everything. I have friends who need to know that they are loved by God. And so do you. I have family members that are rejecting truth. And they need to know that God is waiting for them to repent and return to Him. He still loves them. And God 
is sending us into his harvest. And Jesus says this to them. He says, he's sending them out, but he also says what? He says, ask the Lord of the harvest. He doesn't say, go out and start doing the work. He says, As you, when you're working, you're to be praying. You're to be praying. Sometimes, I get busy doing really good work for God. And I tell myself, that's really good work for God. And God says, but you haven't listened to me at all today. I said, but I did really good work for you, God. <laughs> Lord, I've spent, I've spent three hours studying and working on a message, Lord. But he says, but you, you didn't read the Bible to learn anything about where you are spiritually at all today. I called you to work in the harvest, and I called you to pray. I called you to listen. I called you to be in my presence. It's simple. I mean, it, Jesus doesn't make this complicated. calls us to pray as we work. doesn't call us to do nothing, but he says, as you work, you need to be praying. So he says, harvest is plentiful, but the workers, if you ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road, but go to your assignment. That's what he's saying. I had to go to your assignment, but he says, but go. And we, we read that passage, he's like, go, I'm sending you like lambs among the wolves. No, thank you. I've seen a lamb and I've seen a wolf. <laughs> Think about, this is a powerful verse. Okay, so Jesus sends them and they go, and, 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 and they, and, uh, they come back and God does great things on this trip. But Jesus, when he says, go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves, is a powerful statement. What did John the Baptist call Jesus? He called him the Lamb of God, right? John chapter, John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him, and Jesus was coming to him to be baptized. And John said this, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What saves us from sin? Well, Jesus, right? The Lamb of God who gave himself up, who sacrificed himself so we could be forgiven. John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God who came as servant of law, who came because he loves you, because he loves me, who came uh, and suffered for us in every way, but was without sin, went to the cross for us and defeated death and sin and the grave. And Jesus says to his workers, to you and I, if you're a follower of Christ, you're called to work in his harvest field. I don't care what your gift mix is, what your personality type is. If you are a follower of Christ, he wants you to work in his harvest field. And he needs Christians in every walk of life. I met some men of God who, who worked on our roof the last couple of weeks when it wasn't very nice to work on our roof. And God needs people who work on roofs. God needs people who fix toilets. God needs people in offices. God needs people who fix cars. God needs people who teach in our schools. And God needs people that will go overseas. God calls you to work at his harvest. If you're a follower of Christ, you're called to work at his harvest. And he says, I'm sending you out like a lamb among wolves. I have empowered you with the life-saving blood of Jesus to go into this world that will be filled with obstacles, that will say things about you that are not true, that will come against you, but you are going as, as a lamb among the wolves. That means you have the blood of Jesus with you, and he will empower you with what you need to, to 
make his love known in this world. Do you know when you are ridiculed for being a follower of Christ, when people make fun of you, when people reject what you say, that you're still called to be a servant to them and to love them? Jesus was the Lamb of God who came to serve all and died for those who were opposed to him. I used to read this passage and I would kind of go over that part. Oh, yeah, we're going like lambs among wolves. We're going to face hardship, but we're empowered by the blood of Jesus. His Holy Spirit fills us. That's a powerful statement. Jesus said in Exodus to the children of Israel, I will go before you and will drive out those who are in front of you. And I will do it as you are ready. I will not overwhelm you so the land will overtake you. I will lead you. Jesus said, go, I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out into a hostile place. There will be obstacles in front of you, but I will go before you. I will be with you. Some of you have picked up the book uh, Follow the Cloud by John Stickle. And there's a quote in that book I want to share with you. He says this, The goal of the Christian life is not about getting us to heaven someday. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. But that's not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is about bringing heaven to earth today. It's about helping people see and know who Jesus is. It's about helping them know that they can know that the same peace that I know in the midst of things that seem chaotic and a mess and confusing. I want to be a follower of Christ that's helping people see and know who Jesus is today. I want to be a follower of Christ that isn't over, overwhelmed with obstacles, but says God can still move and do things. The sad part of, of reading Numbers is we see that the people believed a bad report and they missed what God had for them in that time. That generation did not see the promised land except for the two who believed God's promise, Caleb and Joshua. They had a different spirit. There's a cartoon that I saw a couple years ago. It shows Moses leading the children of Israel through the Red Sea. And there's water on both sides of the boat. And uh, we see all the people coming. And you can see the Egyptian army behind them in the background. They're, they're chasing them. And there's Moses. And there's a guy standing there in Bermuda shorts with a surfboard. And Moses says, I don't think you understand the seriousness of the situation, Caleb. I want to be the guy that believes God. I want to be the follower of Christ that believes that God's going before me. I want to be the guy that's that even in the midst when everything seems like it's falling apart, it says, but God's still doing something big here. And he's going to empower us with what we need. I want to be the person that says, even if I suffer, Lord, I'll suffer for you because it's for the sake of Christ. You've been called of God to work in his harvest. Jesus said early in his ministry that he was anointed to preach to the sick, to heal the sick, to heal the blind. That he was called to preach um, of, uh, that Jesus was the Son of God. That Jesus' message was to repent and believe, to turn from, to turn from the way you're living and to follow him to follow this way of life where he is the Messiah and Lord of your life. Jesus said that the night of his arrest, he told his disciples, he told his followers, you'll do even greater things than I have done because you'll be filled with my Holy Spirit. What was he saying? He said, I'm not going to stop doing what you've seen me do. We're called to be his people. Almost every day, and I should do it every day, but almost every day I ask the Holy Spirit to use me, to fill me. God promises that His Holy Spirit dwells within us and moves within us, but um, 
on my own, I quickly forget. The Holy Spirit doesn't force its way. It doesn't force its way to make decisions for you. We must submit to it. And I have to remind myself on a regular basis, Holy Spirit, fill me, use me. Allow my heart to be shaped by you. The title of the message this morning, Release His Kingdom. It's about living our mission. Last week, as, a, as part of our service, we read from the, we, uh, we made some declarations, and some of our declarations were, were strongly rooted in the, in the prayer that's found in Ephesians chapter 6. And today I want to close, um, I want to close today by having you listen to these words and receive them. So I want to ask you to do this today. I want you to forget who's sitting next to you or behind you for a moment or in front of you. I want you to hear these words and I want you to receive them. Asking God how he would have you receive them. So let's close your eyes with me for a moment and, uh, and let's just hear these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. Father, this morning, Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged in our walk. I pray that we would the followers of Christ who are pursuing learning about you, who are pursuing being in your word, who are pursuing spending those times listening to what you have. Father, I pray right now, if there is anyone in this room, there is anyone hearing this message who does not know what it is to have surrendered their heart to you, that today they would they would come to you in an honest confession and repentance and turn to you. That they would surrender their life to you. And Lord, if there is anyone who has need of someone praying with them, Lord, I pray today they would seek out um, one of the pastors, their, their Sunday school teacher, maybe the person who brought them to, uh, to begin to talk and pray through these things. Father, we thank you for meeting with us this day. And we will give you the glory in Jesus' name.